I'm really enjoying preaching to it, so I'm hoping y'all are enjoying hearing it. Um, but this morning we start a, a new section. Um, we're still in chapter 2, but it's a new section of, of chapter 2. And uh, I, I titled this section, or calling it, Jesus' Peace Mission. And we all should be on that mission with Jesus to, to share and, sh and, and spread the, the peace of Jesus Christ. And as I was studying this week, it, I come across some things that was talking about peace trees and, and how there's been thousands and thousands of peace trees you know, throughout the history of the earth and into the world, and uh, but that none of them really ever last very long. Uh, it said that there were 7,500 peace trees made between different nations, not just certain specific ones, but different nations throughout the world between 1500 BC and AD 850, uh, with hope of having lasting peace. They, they signed these peace treaties hoping that they would have lasting peace that would last. You know, right on through the end of their, the world. But the, the average of those peace treaties were two years. Two years. The only peace treaty that has, has lasted and will last is the one made by God Almighty through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's the only peace treaty. That's the only way that we can have peace in life is through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. You know, we can try to find peace in money. We can try to find peace in, in collecting material possessions. We, we try to find peace in, in all kinds of different things. Um, you know, I haven't quite found it in food yet. I've been trying a long time and it shows, but you know, some of us, food is a comfort. You know, we, we eat to comfort ourselves during stressful times or, you know, I, I tend to eat when I'm sitting and I'm bored. You know, it's dark outside. I can't go, go outside and tinker and, you know, sitting there watching TV, I get the munchies. I want to eat something. But we can find that peace through Jesus Christ. And, and he is a mission to sh for us to share that peace throughout the world. And we're going to look at this peace mission throughout the next three weeks. And uh, this, we'll look at three different things, three different important words that uh, describe that peace mission. And their separation, reconciliation, and unification. And this morning we're going to look at separation in, in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 12. And uh, so we're going to look at separation, the word separation, and what the Gentiles were. So Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12 says this. Wherefore, remember that ye being in times past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcised by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. That at the time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. The first ten verses of Ephesians chapter 2, Paul has discussed salvation in general terms amongst all people, Jews, Gentiles, all people across the world. He's discussed salvation. And most believers in Ephesus were Gentiles, so now he's breaking it down to the Gentiles. Now he's, he's narrowing his focus down to the Gentile people, which if you know, have ever heard or studied about Gentiles or the Bible, you know that you got the Jews and you got the Gentiles. So if you're not Jewish by heritage, then you're a Gentile. So most of us here um, are, are probably Gentiles. For centuries, the Jews had looked down on these Gentiles. They, they thought that they were better than them because they were circumcised. And, and the covenant God made with Abraham, he told him to sign his covenant, go and be circumcised. And, and all your people, all your male children of eight days and older are to be circumcised. So they weren't Gentiles, weren't circumcised people at those times. And so the Jews thought that, hey, we're better because we're God's chosen people. We, we got a covenant from God. We've been circumcised. The fact that the Jews had received this physical mark of the covenant was no proof that they were men of faith. They, they, it doesn't prove that they were believers. You know, I, I can go down to the local tattoo parlor and get a cross tattooed on my arm. That doesn't make me a Christian. I, I can go down there and get John 316 tattooed down my arm. It doesn't make me a Christian. I, I can go and I can put a cross hanging from my rear view mirror or one of those fish stickers on the back of my car and it doesn't make me a Christian. I can come and sit in a pew every Sunday morning and it doesn't make me a Christian. 
It, it's not the, the physical appearance. It's not the physical mark. It's the inward mark. It's the heart. We know scripture tells us God doesn't look on the outward appearance. Thank God. But he looks at the heart. In Colossians, two, in Colossians chapter 2 verse 11, we are told about those who have trusted Christ have received a spiritual circumcision made without hands. The, the Jews were circumcised physically of the flesh. As born-again believers, as Christians, we are, fit, we are spiritually circumcised. That means God has, has went in and he's removed the dirt from our heart. He's removed the, the, the bad parts of our heart. God set the Jews apart so that, that he might use them to, to be a channel of his revelation and goodness to the Gentile people. God chose the, the Israelite people, the Hebrew people, the Jews, for a reason. To set them apart. Not so that they could walk around and say, hey, I'm better than you. He didn't choose us as believers to walk around and, and, and think we're all holier or higher and mightier than other people. He chose us to set us apart. That we would be different from the world so that people would see Jesus in us. Not that so we could stand around and be like, well, I'm saved and you're... I'm better than you. See, the Jews, they kept the, the separation part as far as nationally and ritually went. They, they kept all the rituals and, and all their national differences from the Gentile countries. But when it came to spiritual, they weren't no different. They followed the pagan gods a lot of the time. That's why we see multiple times throughout the Old Testament the Jewish people being exiled into other countries. Because God was using that as a, as a disciplinary action towards him. <clears throat> the one word that best describes Gentiles in comparison to, to the Jews is without. The word without. They were outside in several respects. And we're going to look at five different things this morning that the Gentiles were without. The first thing that they were without, they were without Christ. The Gentiles, unbelievers are without Christ. And the people of Ephesus worshiped the goddess Diana. That was their main, that was the main religion, if you would, of the, of the city Ephesus. And before the coming of the gospel, they knew nothing about Christ. They, they didn't follow Christ. They hadn't heard about Christ. And we hear in society today that on this, that, that this God is the same as this God. I, I've heard people say, well, Allah, the, the God of Islam, it is the same God as Christianity. Oh, and Buddha, he, he's the same God as Christianity. And, and, and this God and that God, they're all the same. How, how do we not know that they're not all the same? You, you may even look at people's bumper stickers and it says, coexist. Well, we should coexist because we're all humans and we should all get along together. And, but we're not all the same. My God is not the same as all of them. My God's not the same as Buddha. And, and see, we can talk about God. And, and, and somebody that believes in Allah or Buddha, they may not know. They may think, hey, well, he's talking about the same God I'm talking about. Because we're just saying God. But the moment that we mention the word Christ, the moment that we talk about Christ, we've changed it all up. People will stand around and listen to you talk about God. Because, again, you may be talking about Allah. You may be talking about Buddha. But when you mention Jesus Christ, you've narrowed it down to the one true God, almighty God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. And, yes, there's other religions that even believe in Jesus. But they don't believe that he is the Messiah. A few years ago, I, I did one of my classes in Bible college was world history or world religions and, and it was really shocking to me to know that how many other religions have scripture right from the word of god in their religion the majority of the quran comes from right here now now let me say it's not word for word the same they've taken it and they've twisted it They've taken it and left parts out. Because, see, all these different people throughout history, 
And, and, and a lot of them grew up in, in, in Christian churches. They, they grew up following the Word of God. But the Word of God stepped on their toes too many times. So they said, well, I, I'm going to take this, but I don't like this part in Proverbs, or I don't like this part in, in John, or I don't like this part, so I'm going to change it to fit what I want it to say. So they don't step on my toes no more. So it, it fits the way I want to live and what I want to do. Well, 10, 15 years ago, if I did that, I would just have to left the bottle still sitting on the shelf. I mean, because anything we read here, God can use to convict us of the things that we're living in and the, and the sins that we're committing. It, it's not meant so that we say, well, you know, that kind of hurt my feelings a little bit or, or that stepped on my toes too much today, so... I'll skip that, that page in the Bible. I'll skip that book in the Bible. And that's what a lot of these world religions did. Is they took scripture and they just changed it to fit their lifestyle. The things that they were doing. Without Christ, people are in a state of tragedy. Without Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Let me say that personal Lord and Savior. This isn't a get out of hell free card. You know, it's not Monopoly where you get the get out of jail free card. You stick it in your wallet and, and then when you die, you pull out your card and say, God, I got this. I, I went to the altar and the pastor gave me that. Well, isn't that baptismal certificate good for something? God? No, because you didn't mean it in your heart. You we can dunk you all day long in that baptistry. That don't get you to heaven. That don't get you through the pearly gates. You got to be have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And we need to keep in mind that every person that is unsaved, no matter if they're Jew or Gentile, no matter what color their skin is, no matter what religion they grew up in, they are unsaved. And they are outside of Christ. And that means they're condemned. They're going to hell. They're going to be completely for eternity separated from God Almighty. The second thing we see in, in Ephesians there is we're without citizenship. God calls the Jews and, and, and build them into a nation. He told Abraham, I'm going to build a great nation from your seed, from your, from your lineage. He gave them his laws. He gave them his blessings. And Jews were citizens of, his, of God's great nation. Now, a Gentile could enter. And they, they could convert and, and, and become a, a part of that Jewish nation. But they would never be of Jewish lineage. You know, you can move into red level. But you're not, all, you're not going to be born in red level. You know, we have people coming to America every day by the hundreds and thousands. Because they want a part of the American dream. Now, they can come and, and they can go through the whole process of becoming a U.S. citizen. But they're not U.S. by birth. But see, they could come. And just in, in our days where we see citizenship as a big issue. In our country today, it was a big issue at that time. See, because the Jews would go around and flaunt it in their face and throw it in their face. Hey, you're a Gentile. I'm a Jew. I mean, how many of us do that today? Oh, you're a Mexican or you're a, you're a Japanese or a Chinese or, or Filipinos or whatever you are. And I'm an American. Well, I mean, I praise God that I'm American by birth. But that doesn't make me any better than the guy that came from China or Mexico. Because when it all boils down to, when we stand in front of God, he's not going to say, well, were you born in America? Because that ain't going to make a world of a difference. He's going to want to see, he's going to look and say, you don't have the shed blood of Jesus Christ on your life. There's the exit. He's not going to say, well, you got the American flag tattooed on your arm. Come on in. 
No, he, he ain't worried about that. We don't need to worry about that. We need to worry about does people have the shed blood of Jesus Christ on their life? No matter where they're from, no matter what they, how they were raised, all that matters is do they have the shed blood of Jesus Christ? Are they a born again believer? Too many times we get hung up with all these worldly things, just like the Jews. The Jews got hung up on being Jews. And too many times we get hung up on being Americans. And I'm not downplaying being American. And I appreciate you men and women that have served in our armed forces more than I could ever, ever stress. I, I, I appreciate that service and that, that sacrifice. And I thank God that I was born in America. But when it comes down to the word of God, you know the America's never even mentioned in here. But the shed blood of Jesus Christ is. Because that's what matters. The third thing we see is without covenant. The Gentiles were without a covenant with God. While they could be blessed through the covenant God made with Abraham. On Wednesday nights we've been studying in the book of Genesis. And we have seen just recently a couple of weeks a couple months ago in Genesis chapter 12 where God blessed Abraham and he told him, those who bless you, I will bless them. Those who curse you, I will curse them. And I, I would say that probably one of the, the reasons that we're so blessed here in America is because we've been allies. We've been friends with Israel. We, we're not their enemies. Israel is the descendants of Abraham and God made the covenant with Abraham. Thousands of years ago, and that covenant is still true today. He told him, this covenant is not just for Abraham. It wasn't just for Isaac and Jacob. That covenant was to last for generations all the way through the end of the earth. And Gentiles were aliens. They were strangers. They, they were not part of that, that covenant. Have, have you ever been somewhere where you didn't really belong? Maybe you, 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 you were invited to a country club or uh, a, a fancy dinner and they forgot to tell you it was a fancy dinner you show up and everybody's in suit and ties and you show up and you're in shorts and a, an old ragged out t-shirt I mean it's on the back side of somebody's ranch so how would you have known that everybody's going to be in suit and tie man you, you, you feel like a sore thumb you know just sticking out like everybody walking by Can you see that guy over there he's got shorts on Everybody's wearing their nice suits and tuxes and everything and all, you know, prissy and prancy. You know, they, they drink with their fingers sticking out type of thing. The pinky. We don't do that here in Red Level. I do. <laughs> or, or, or maybe you've been to a foreign country and, and everybody around you is speaking a different language. You ain't got a clue what they're talking about. Matter of fact, they're probably talking about you, and you just don't know it. That's how the, chair, the Gentiles were. The Jews went around poking fun at them and talking about them, and, and, and they felt uneasy. They felt out of place. The Pharisees would even pray daily, Oh God, I give thanks that I'm a Jew and not a Gentile. They didn't care if the Gentiles heard them or not. Because they walk around with their nose stuck in the air. See, God chose the, the Jews to be his called people, his, his chosen people, not to go around and, and smear it in other people's faces. Not to go around and say, hey, I'm a Jew, I'm better than you. Just the, just the same, he didn't call us to be Christians to go around and say, hey, I'm a Christian, you're going to hell, ha, ha, ha. We're not to go around and smear it in other people's face. We're not to go around and think we're all high and mighty better than other people. I may be the pastor of this church, but I am no better than any of you. I put my pants on the same way. One leg at a time. Sometimes it takes time. <laughs> Sometimes you got to take that pair back off because they hung in the closet too long and they shrunk. <laughs> but we're all the same. Those people walking down the street, 
You know, we were at the fair yesterday, and, and, and I thank God for Crystal and Leslie coming by and helping us. Enjoyed spending time with them, and, and they did an excellent job, and had to take them to the back side of the fair to help out back there, because things were going on back there, too. And, but, you know, we seen people after people after people. A lot of them didn't look like me. I didn't meet any of them that were from Red Level. So they ain't none of them talk like me. They didn't speak red level, as my wife says. But you know, every one of them were the same as me in the sense that they need Jesus Christ. I mean, I thank God I'm saved by grace. I haven't shed blood of Jesus Christ on my life. But they need it too. They need that. So no matter what they look like, no matter how they talk, no matter where they're from, they need the shed blood of Jesus Christ just as much as I do. As believers, we are God's chosen people. and We're part of his mission to spread peace throughout this world. We need to get off our high horses and realize that God has called us to be apart. Apart from the world. But a part of the world enough that we can share Christ. We're not to follow the world. We're not to act like the world. See, the world acts like you, you got the people in the world that, you know, they're the, the doctors maybe or the lawyers maybe or this high fluke person or that high fluke person. And they walk around with their nose in the air thinking they're better than everybody else. I, I got money or I, I got this or I got that. And they, they think they're better. We're not to be like that. No matter if you got a million dollars in your wallet this morning or you, butterflies are flying out of it. Without land. The fourth thing we see this morning is without hope. The Gentiles were without hope. Historians tell us that a great cloud of hopelessness covered the ancient world. Philosophies were empty. Traditions were disappearing. Religions were powerless to help men face either life or death. People longed to purse, pierce the veil and get some message of hope from the other side, but there was none. People are still today looking for hope. Because without Jesus Christ, we have no hope. Without salvation, what is there to hope for? Hope to get the raise? Hope to get the next new truck? Well, that raise will eventually wear off and you're shooting for the next raise. That new truck will eventually break down. That new house will eventually need fixing. All those things, I mean, you can acquire millions of dollars. But when it's all over with, when you're standing at the pearly gates, God's not going to ask how, many, how much money you got in your savings account. How many charities have you helped? Again, he's going to look at your heart. People in this world need that hope. I know I've shared this multiple times, but I think of Deion Sanders who, who had everything in the world. He had money, power, fame, women, drugs, everything. And he said, I, I couldn't figure out, I couldn't find that hope until he ran his car off of a 100-foot cliff, hit the bottom, and he came to, he realized, the only hope is in Jesus Christ. All the stuff in the world doesn't matter without Jesus. 1 Thessalonians 4, 12 through 18, I'm gonna, or 4, 13 through 18, I'm going to read it to you here. It says, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them, them which are asleep that ye so sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then which we 
are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Right here, Jesus is telling us that those who have passed on before us, God, God hadn't forgot about them. We aren't going to, we that are alive when Jesus comes in, in the clouds and he blows the trumpet for us to come, we're not going to prevent those from being with him. Here the, the, the scripture says they are caught up. We would be caught up. And I, I you know, as much as I want to see heaven, as much as I want to see the loved ones that have went on before me, as much as I want to stand and hear and see God Almighty and, and listen to Jesus, man, I think it'd be awesome to be here on the day of of the rapture. Now, now the Bible here says caught up. We call it the rapture. And boy, I man, I think it'd just be awesome to be here when the rapture came. <clears throat> Jesus has promised to return for us. And we can stand firm on his promises that he will return, that he will come for us. There's hope in that. Death can be scary. You know, and, and the older you get, you know, I remember as a kid, we were, we were indestructible. We were in this, you know, we were invisible. Man, you didn't stop for nothing. You'd climb the tallest tree, jump off the highest building. It didn't matter, you, you know, young and dumb. And the older I get, the more I realize if I jump off the roof of that building, it's going to hurt. And then you start thinking about death and dying. People get scared about it. Man, I love what, what we're told in 2 Corinthians 5, 6 and 8 through 8 says, Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, right here, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. The moment we take our last breath here on this earth, we are in the presence with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Man, there's a lot of hope in that. Man, I, I have hope that, and I know that, that if I die in a car accident or if I don't wake up one morning or whatever the situation is, the last breath I take here on this earth, the next one I'm taking in the presence of Jesus Christ. The, the fifth thing we see here is without God. The Gentiles were without God. They had plenty of gods. They had gods all over God, the Greek gods. They, they had these gods and that gods and, and all these different gods. But the Gentiles, no matter how religious or moral they might be, they did not follow or worship the true God. They may have followed the, the, the Greek god of this or the Greek god of that. They may have followed Diana, the, the, this, this God or that God. <coughs> but all those gods don't matter unless we follow the one true God. And people want to say, well, what, what, what about, how, what if they didn't know that God? What if they don't know God Almighty? Let me read you Romans chapter 1, verses 19 through 22. It says there, because that, because that which may be known of God is manifested in them. For God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understand, understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination. And their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became foolish. They knew God. He says they were without excuse. See, because God has revealed himself to us through creation, through all these things in life, he says they're without excuse. So no matter what God they may have followed, God has revealed to them that he is the true God. That is through creation. And he says they're without excuse. They, they have no excuse 
that won't be that won't stand worthy in front of me. God chose the Jews, and he, he gave them his word. He gave them his laws, his blessings. He even sent his only begotten son through the Jewish heritage. See, Israel was supposed to be a light to the Gentiles. They were supposed to share Jesus Christ with the Gentiles. But they made themselves darkened. They, they made themselves an enemy, more or less, to the, to the Gentiles. And we need to heed the warning today. We need to see that it is our job as Christians to share the love and the light of Jesus Christ in this peace mission with the people of this world. We are to share our love for God and the, the love that he has given to us to this lost and dying world. Let's close with a word of prayer.